Russell Amos Kirk October 19, 1918, to April 29, 1994, was an American political theorist, moralist, historian, social critic, and literary critic, known for his influence on 20th-century American conservatism. His 1953 book The Conservative Mind gave shape to the amorphous post-World War II conservative movement. It traced the development of conservative thought in the Anglo-American tradition, giving special importance to the ideas of Edmund Burke. Kirk was considered the chief proponent of traditionalist conservatism. He was also an accomplished author of gothic and ghost story fiction. Life Russell Kirk was born in Plymouth, Michigan. He was the son of Russell Andrew Kirk, a railroad engineer, and Marjorie Pierce Kirk. Kirk obtained his B.A. at Michigan State University and a M.A. at Duke University. During World War II, he served in the American Armed Forces and corresponded with a libertarian writer, Isabel Patterson, who helped to shape his early political thought. After reading Albert J. Knox's book, Our Enemy, The State, he engaged in a similar correspondence with him. After the war, he attended the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. In 1953, he became the only American to be awarded the degree of Doctor of Letters by that university, Kirk laid out a post-World War II program for conservatives by warning them, a handful of individuals, some of them quite unused to moral responsibilities on such a scale, made it their business to extirpate the populations of Nagasaki and Hiroshima, we must make it our business to curtail the possibility of such snap decisions." Upon completing his studies, Kirk took up an academic position at his alma mater, Michigan State. He resigned in 1959, after having become disenchanted with the rapid growth in student number and emphasis on intercollegiate athletics and technical training at the expense of the traditional liberal arts. Thereafter he referred to Michigan State as, Cow College, or, Behemoth University. He later wrote that academic political scientists and sociologists were, as a breed, dull dogs. Late in life, he taught one semester a year at Hillsdale College, where he was distinguished visiting professor of humanities. Kirk frequently published in two American conservative journals he helped found, National Review in 1955 and Modern Age in 1957. He was the founding editor of the latter, 1957 to 59. Later he was made a Distinguished Fellow of the Heritage Foundation, where he gave a number of lectures. After leaving Michigan State, Kirk returned to his ancestral home in Macosta, Michigan, where he wrote the many books, academic articles, lectures, and the syndicated newspaper column which ran for 13 years by which he exerted his influence on American politics and intellectual life. In 1963, Kirk converted to Catholicism and married Annette Cordemanche. They had four daughters. She and Kirk became known for their hospitality, welcoming many political, philosophical, and literary figures in their Macosta house known as Piety Hill, and giving shelter to political refugees, hobos, and others. Their home became the site of a sort of seminar on conservative thought for university students. Piety Hill now houses the Russell Kirk Center for Cultural Renewal. After his conversion to Catholicism, Kirk was a founding board member of Una Voce America. Kirk declined to drive, calling cars mechanical Jacobins, and would have nothing to do with television and what he called electronic computers. Kirk did not always maintain a stereotypically conservative voting record. Faced with the non-choice between Franklin Delano Roosevelt and Thomas Dewey in 1944, Kirk said no to Empire and voted for Norman Thomas, the Socialist Party candidate. In the 1976 presidential election, he voted for Eugene McCarthy. In 1992 he supported Pat Buchanan's primary challenge to incumbent George H. W. Bush, serving as state chair of the Buchanan campaign in Michigan. Kirk was a contributor to Chronicles. In 1989, he was presented with the Presidential Citizens Medal by President Ronald Reagan. Ideas The conservative mind The conservative mind, from Burke to Santayana, the published version of Kirk's doctoral dissertation, contributed materially to the 20th-century Burke revival. It also drew attention to 
Conservative statesmen such as John Adams, Alexander Hamilton, Fisher Ames, George Canning, John C. Calhoun, John Randolph of Roanoke, Joseph de Maistre, Benjamin Disraeli, and Arthur Balfour. The conservative implications of writings by well-known authors such as Samuel Taylor Coleridge, Sir Walter Scott, Alexis de Tocqueville, James Fenimore Cooper, Nathaniel Hawthorne, James Russell Lowell, George Gissing, George Santayana, Robert Frost, and T. S. Eliot. British and American authors such as Fisher Ames, John Randolph of Roanoke, Orestes Brownson, John Henry Newman, Walter Bagay Ho, Henry James Sumner Maine, William Edward Hartpole Lecky, Edwin Lawrence Godkin, William Horrell Malick, Leslie Stephen, Albert Venn Dicey, Robert Nisbet, Paul Elmer Moore, and Irving Babbitt. The Portable Conservative Reader, 1982, which Kirk edited, contains sample writings by most of the above. Biographer Bradley J. Berzer argues that for all his importance in inspiring the modern conservative movement, not many of his followers agreed with his unusual approach to the history of conservatism. As summarized by reviewer Drew McCaig, As Berzer's study demonstrates, Kirk's understanding of conservatism was so unique, idiosyncratic, transcendental, elitist, and in certain respects premodern and European, that it bore little resemblance to political conservatism in the United States. Conservative mind successfully launched an intellectual challenge to post-war liberalism, but the variety of conservatism Kirk preferred found few takers, even within the American right. Harry Jaffa, a student of Leo Strauss, wrote, "Kirk was a poor Burke scholar. Burke's attack on metaphysical reasoning related only to modern philosophy's attempt to eliminate skeptical doubt from its premises and hence from its conclusions." Russello 2004 argues that Kirk adapted what 19th-century American Catholic thinker Orestes Brownson called territorial democracy to articulate a version of federalism that was based on premises that differ in part from those of the founders and other conservatives. Kirk further believed that territorial democracy could reconcile the tension between treating the states as mere provinces of the central government, and as autonomous political units independent of Washington. Finally, territorial democracy allowed Kirk to set out a theory of individual rights grounded in the particular historical circumstances of the United States, while rejecting a universal conception of such rights. Principles Kirk developed six «canons» of conservatism, which Russello described as follows a belief in a transcendent order, which Kirk described variously as based in tradition, divine revelation, or natural law. An affection for the variety and mystery of human existence. A conviction that society requires orders and classes that emphasize natural distinctions. A belief that property and freedom are closely linked. A faith in custom, convention, and prescription, and a recognition that innovation must be tied to existing traditions and customs, which entails a respect for the political value of prudence. Kirk said that Christianity and Western civilization are unimaginable apart from one another, and that all culture arises out of religion. When religious faith decays, culture must decline, though often seeming to flourish for a space after the religion which has nourished it has sunk into disbelief. Kirk and libertarianism Kirk grounded his Burkean conservatism in tradition, political philosophy, belles lettres, and the strong religious faith of his later years, rather than libertarianism and free market economic reasoning. The conservative mind hardly mentions economics at all. In a polemic, Kirk, quoting T. S. Eliot's expression, called libertarians, chirping sectaries adding that conservatives and libertarians share opposition to «collectivism», the totalist state, and «bureaucracy», but otherwise have «nothing» in common. He called the libertarian movement «an ideological clique forever splitting into sects still smaller and odder, but rarely conjugating». He said a line of division exists between believers in «some sort of transcendent moral order» and Utilitarians admitting no transcendent sanctions for conduct. He included libertarians in the latter category. Kirk, therefore, questioned the fusionism between libertarians and traditional conservatives that marked much of post World War II conservatism in the United States. Kirk's view of classical liberals 
is positive though, he agrees with them on ordered liberty, as they make common cause with regular conservatives against the menace of democratic despotism and economic collectivism. Tiber R. Mackin defended libertarianism in response to Kirk's original Heritage Lecture. Mackin argued that the right of individual sovereignty is perhaps most worthy of conserving from the American political heritage, and that when conservatives themselves talk about preserving some tradition, they cannot at the same time claim a disrespectful distrust of the individual human mind, of rationalism itself. Jacob G. Hornberger of the Future of Freedom Foundation also responded to Kirk. Topic: <laughs> Kirk and neoconservatism. Late in life, Kirk grew disenchanted with American neoconservatives as well. As Chronicle's editor Scott Rickert describes it, One line helped define the emerging struggle between neoconservatives and paleoconservatives. Not seldom has it seemed, Kirk declared, as if some eminent neoconservatives mistook Tel Aviv for the capital of the United States. A few years later, in another Heritage Foundation speech, Kirk repeated that line verbatim. In the wake of the Gulf War, which he had opposed, he clearly understood that those words carried even greater meaning. He also commented the neoconservatives were often clever, never wise. Midge Dechter, director of the Committee for the Free World, called Kirk's remark, a bloody outrage, a piece of antisemitism by Kirk that impugns the loyalty of neoconservatives. She told the New Republic, it's this notion of a Christian civilization. You have to be part of it or you're not really fit to conserve anything. That's an old line and it's very ignorant. Samuel T. Francis called Kirk's Tel Aviv remark a wisecrack about the slavishly pro-Israel sympathies among neoconservatives. He described Dechter's response as untrue, reckless, and vitriolic. Furthermore, he argued that such a denunciation always plays into the hands of the left, which is then able to repeat the charges and claim conservative endorsement of them. Topic. Kirk and the Gulf War Toward the end of his life, Russell Kirk was highly critical of Republican militarism. President Bush, Kirk said, had embarked upon a radical course of intervention in the region of the Persian Gulf. Excerpts from Russell Kirk's lectures at the Heritage Foundation 1992. Presidents Woodrow Wilson, Franklin Roosevelt, and Lyndon Johnson were enthusiasts for American domination of the world. Now George Bush appears to be emulating those eminent Democrats. When the Republicans, once upon a time, nominated for the presidency a one world candidate, Wendell Wilkie, they were sadly trounced. In general, Republicans throughout the 20th century have been advocates of prudence and restraint in the conduct of foreign affairs. Unless the Bush administration abruptly reverses its fiscal and military course, I suggest, the Republican Party must lose its former good repute for frugality, and become the party of profligate expenditure, butter and guns, and public opinion would not long abide that. Nor would America's world influence and America's remaining prosperity. Yet presidents of the United States must not be encouraged to make perpetual war for perpetual peace, nor to fancy that they can establish a new world order through eliminating dissenters. In the second century before Christ, the Romans generously liberated the Greek city-states from the yoke of Macedonia. But it was not long before the Romans felt it necessary to impose upon those quarrelsome Greeks a domination more stifling to Hellenic freedom and culture than ever Macedon had been. It is a duty of the Congress of the United States to see that great American Caesars do not act likewise. Topic. Man of letters Kirk's other important books include Eliot and His Age, T.S. Eliot's Moral Imagination in the Twentieth Century 1972, The Roots of American Order 1974, and The Autobiographical Sword of the Imagination, Memoirs of a Half-Century of Literary Conflict 1995. As was the case with his hero Edmund Burke, Kirk became renowned for the prose style of his intellectual and polemical writings. Topic. Fiction. 
Beyond his scholarly achievements, Kirk was talented both as an oral storyteller and as an author of genre fiction, most notably in his telling of consummate ghost stories in the classic tradition of Sheridan Le Fanu, M. R. James, Oliver Onions, and H. Russell Wakefield. He also wrote other admired and much anthologized works that are variously classified as horror, fantasy, science fiction, and political satire. These earned him plaudits from fellow creative writers as varied and distinguished as T.S. Eliot, Robert Aikman, Madeleine Langell, and Ray Bradbury. Though modest in quantity—it encompasses three novels and twenty-two short stories—Kirk's body of fiction was written amid a busy career as prolific nonfiction writer, editor, and speaker. As with such other speculative fiction authors as G. K. Chesterton, C. S. Lewis, and J. R. R. Tolkien all of whom likewise wrote only nonfiction for their day jobs, there are conservative undercurrents—social, cultural, religious, and political—to Kirk's fiction. His first novel, Old House of Fear 1961, 1965, as with so many of his short stories, was written in a self-consciously gothic vein. Here the plot is concerned with an American assigned by his employer to a bleak locale in rural Scotland—the same country where Kirk had attended graduate school. This was Kirk's most commercially successful and critically acclaimed fictional work, doing much to sustain him financially in subsequent years. Later novels were A Creature of the Twilight 1966, a dark comedy satirizing post-colonial African politics, and Lord of the Hollow Dark 1979, 1989, set in Scotland, which explores the great evil inhabiting a haunted house. During his lifetime, Kirk also oversaw the publication of three collections which together encompassed all his short stories. Three more such collections have been published posthumously, but those only reprint stories found in the earlier volumes. Among his novels and stories, certain characters tend to recur, enriching the already considerable unity and resonance of his fictional canon. Though, through their themes and prose style, Kirk's fiction and nonfiction works are complementary, many readers of the one have not known of his work in the other. Having begun to write fiction fairly early in his career, Kirk appears to have stopped after the early 1980s, while continuing his nonfiction writing and research through his last year of life. For a comprehensive bibliography of his fiction, see the fiction section of his bibliography. Bibliography References Further reading Atarian, John, 1998. Russell Kirk's Political Economy. Modern Age 42 87-97. ISSN 0026-7457. Berzer, Bradley J. Russell Kirk, American Conservative University Press of Kentucky, 2015. 574 pp. Brown, Charles C. Ed. Russell Kirk, A Bibliography 2nd ed. 2011, Wilmington, Issy Books, 2011 220 pages, replaces Brown's 1981 bibliography Campbell, William F. Fall 1994. An Economist's Tribute to Russell Kirk. The Intercollegiate Review. The Intercollegiate Studies Institute reprinted with permission by the Philadelphia Society. ISSN 0020-5249. OCLC 1,716,938. Archived from the original on February 22, 2010. East, John P. 1984. Russell Kirk as a political theorist, perceiving the need for order in the soul and in society. Modern Age 28-33-44. ISSN 0026-7457. Fieser, Edward C. 2008. Conservative Critique of Libertarianism. In Hamowy, Ronald. The Encyclopedia of Libertarianism. Thousand Oaks, CA, Sage, Cato Institute. pp. 95-97. doi, 10.4135, 9781412965811, N62. ISBN 978-1-4129-6580-4. LCCN 2008,009,151. OCLC 750,831,024. Filler, Lewis. 
The Wizard of Macosta, Russell Kirk of Michigan, Michigan History, Vol. 63 No. 5 Sept to October 1979. Fuller, Edmund. A Genre for Exploring the Reality of Evil, Wall Street Journal, July 23, 1979. Henley, Mark M. Jr., Dark World Enough in Time, Gothic, Vol. 2 No. 1 June 1980. Heron, Don. The Crepuscular Romantic, An Appreciation of the Fiction of Russell Kirk, The Romantist, No. 3 1979. Kirk, Russell, Introduction, The Canon of Ghostly Tales in the Scallion Stone by Canon Basil A. Smith. Chapel Hill, N.C., Whispers Press, 1980. Heron, Don. Russell Kirk, Ghost Master of Macosta in Daryl Schweitzer, ed. Discovering Modern Horror Fiction, Mercer's, Wa, Starmont House, July 1985, pp. 21-47. Kirk, Russell, 1995. The Sword of Imagination, Memoirs of a Half-Century of Literary Conflict. Kirk's Memoirs. MacDonald, W. Wesley, 1982. The Conservative Mind of Russell Kirk, Backquote The Permanent Things in an Age of Ideology. Ph.D. Dissertation, The Catholic University of America. Citation, Die 1982-43-1, 255a. DA 8213740. Online at ProQuest Dissertations and Theses, 1983, Reason, Natural Law, and Moral Imagination in the Thought of Russell Kirk, Modern Age 27-15-24. ISSN 0026-7457. 2004. Russell Kirk and the Age of Ideology. University of Missouri Press. 1999. Russell Kirk and the Prospects for Conservatism, Humanitas 12, 56-76, 2006. Kirk, Russell, 1918-94, In American Conservatism, an Encyclopedia Issy Books, 471-474. Biographical Entry. McCloyd, Aaron. Great Conservative Minds, A Condensation of Russell Kirk's The Conservative Mind Alabama Policy Institute, 2005, 71 pp, detailed page-by-page page synopsis Nash, George H., 1998. The Conservative Intellectual Movement in America. Person Jr., James E., 1999. Russell Kirk, A Critical Biography of a Conservative Mind. Madison Books. Purnell, Jerry, Uncanny Tales of the Moral Imagination, University Bookman, Summer 1979, Vol. 19, No. 4. Russell, Gerald J., 1996, The Jurisprudence of Russell Kirk, Modern Age 38-354-63. ISSN 0026-7457. Reviews Kirk's Writings on Law, 1976-93, Exploring his notion of natural law, his emphasis on the importance of the English common law tradition, and his theories of change and continuity in legal history. 2007. The Postmodern Imagination of Russell Kirk. University of Missouri Press. 1999. Time and Timeless, The Historical Imagination of Russell Kirk, Modern Age 41-209-19. ISSN 0026-7457. 2004, Russell Kirk and Territorial Democracy, Publius 34-109-24. ISSN 0048-5950. Steiger, Brad. A Note on Ghostly Phenomena in Russell Kirk's Old House at Macosta, Michigan, Strange Powers of EDP, NY, Belmont Books, 1969. Sturgeon, Theodore. A Viewpoint, A Dewpoint. National Review, Vol. 14 No. 6, February 12, 1963. Whitney, Gleaves, 2001. The Swords of Imagination, Russell Kirk's Battle with Modernity. Modern Age 43-311-20. ISSN 0026-7457. Argues that Kirk used five. Swords of Imagination. Historical, political, moral, poetic, and prophetic. Topic. External links The Russell Kirk Center for Cultural Renewal The Imaginative Conservative A Resource for those who want to learn more about Dr. Kirk and his thought. Works by Russell Kirk, at Hathi Trust Works by Russell Kirk, at UNZ.org Russell Kirk's articles, at Crisis Magazine. From the Academy Traverse Magazine Profile of Russell Kirk by John J. Miller
The Neoconservatives, an Endangered Species. Heritage Foundation Lecture 178, December 15, 1988. Russell Kirk at the Internet Speculative Fiction Database Appearances on C-SPAN Speech by Russell Kirk on March 21, 1968 on American Conservatives. Audio recording from the University of Alabama's Emphasis Symposium on Contemporary Issues. <laughs>